Thank you all for joining us for live Q&A with Lisa Garcia Bedoya, Vice Provost for Graduate Studies and Dean of the Graduate Division and a professor in the School of Education at the University of California, Berkeley. This session is a compliment to the bite-sized lunchtime talk you've already watched. I will now, I will now introduce Assistant Professor Rebecca Shu from Howard, who will introduce our speaker. Take it away, Rebecca. Let me find, the, okay. Uh, Lisa Garcia Bedoya is Berkeley's Vice Provost of Graduate Studies and Dean of Graduate Division and a professor in the School of Education. She uses the tools of social science to reveal the causes of educational and political inequality in the US. Considering differences across the lines of is no race, gender, class, uh, geographic, et cetera, she believes an intersection and interdisciplinary approach is critical to recognizing the complexity of the contemporary US. She has used a variety of social science methods, uh, participant observations, in-depth interviews, survey research, field experiments, and geographic information system to shed light on these questions. Professor Garcia Bedoya earned her PhD in political science from Yale University and her BA from Latin American studies and comparative literature from UC Berkeley. Let's welcome Lisa Garcia Bedoya. Thank, thank you so much, Rebecca. And it is, uh, it is a pleasure and always a joy to, to share space with you, um, uh, Professor Garcia Bedoya. May I call you Lisa? Please, yes. Thank you, Lisa. I will make it a little easier. I, I have to watch myself. I keep calling you uh, Vice Chancellor. Uh, <laughs> maybe Chancellor. Uh, we're going to jump into some questions. Uh, for those uh, who are joining us for the first time who may not have seen uh, your, your video, uh, could you give us the cliff notes uh, or introduce us to uh, the initiatives that Berkeley has to regularly uh, um, uh, survey and understand the experiences of our graduate students and undergraduates, Go Bears. Go Bears. Thank you, Nanette. I hope it's okay if I call you Nanette. Um, so I, as I guess the short summary is, I, I generally believe that the methods that we use in social science, we have to remember that they often were developed not to study um, minoritized communities, or in fact, to pathologize minoritized communities, as it is true of many of the things that came around the turn of the century and coincided with the eugenics movement. And so I think it's really important to be very mindful of that as we employ these tools. And in my institutional role, though, I think it's important to use data to really try to attempt to um, have the granularity and specificity we need to make sure that all students thrive. And so one of the important things um, I've done in, in addition to just investing in institutional research is really changing the orientation to think about the tales, right? So as an example, one of the common things we use in, in higher ed to decide whether or not you have um, racialized processes happening among students is time to degree or um, differences in time to degree or differences in, in degree attainment, right? At, at whatever level. But uh, we have to remember that there isn't one universal experience uh, for minoritized students. And so just because everyone is graduating at the same time, that doesn't necessarily mean that they've had the same experience. And so we've instituted, so during COVID, we knew we needed real-time information from students. Um, we instituted what we called a pulse survey. This was in partnership with the Division of Undergraduate Education to have quarterly, you know, sort of three times a semester information about students in real time, very short, very easy to fill out. But I've also been working with my team to find other ways to gather information so that we know what those differences are and not assume that you sort of have a homogenous experience across groups and that therefore everything is fine if, if the students look the same, at least on some basic level. So I hope that provides a bit of a primer. That's fantastic. Thank you. Um, so uh, I, I would love, before we jump into questions about your presentation and the, the innovative work uh, that, that Berkeley is doing, and I'd, I'd love to hear from you um, about whether other schools uh, are, are approaching this in the, in the way that Berkeley is. I imagine, as always, that we're a, a, a leader in this space, um, uh, behind in others, but a leader in this space, which I'm excited about. Uh, but can you tell us a little bit about your path to the professoriate? Uh, so I, I use that term thinking about um, our mutual friend and your chief of staff, um, who has a path to the prof professoriate program at Berkeley. Uh, so can you tell us a little bit about um, your story? 
So I'm a child of Cuban refugees. My parents ended up settling in Los Angeles of the few that were in LA. Um, I came to Berkeley as an undergraduate because I fell in love with the campus the first time I visited. I would never have imagined a professorial path. My family still doesn't know what I do for a living really. Um, but it struck me when I was at Berkeley that there were very few people like me in front of the classroom. And also that I just happen to have the kind of brain that the academy privileges. I do well in school, I like school, the idea of being on a college campus appealed to me. And I also felt that responsibility to claim the space for all of the people like me and the people from my community who didn't happen to have that kind of brain or didn't happen to have this sort of opportunity. And so that was really what brought me in to the professoriate. I come to it uh, very much with a Latin American vision of what uh, intellectuals are for um, in Latin America. You know, the intellectual life universities are sanctuaries. That's where all the revolutions start, right? But it's also where um, your people are trained to kind of push society to be its best self, right? And to really be that uh, commentator that's pushing the boundaries and really thinking about how to address society's big problems. And so that's what attracted me. I feel very lucky that um, in my research, so I work on community organizing, I study community organizing, and I've had the privilege of working now for 20 years with dozens at this point of community-based organizations using the tools that we learn in graduate school to in fact um, help them think about and, and improve their practice since people working in nonprofits often just don't have the time uh, to sit back and, and think through how things are going. I was attracted to my vice provost role because I, I felt it was an opportunity. Again, very few people like me are offered these sorts of opportunities. And so it's really important, again, to claim the space um, and take the opportunity to maybe leave the door open a little wider uh, for the people who come next. And also do that through making systemic change. So I feel like faculty have a really important role and I, I would like to think I, I did a good job, or at least I tried to support my students individually, help them find their academic voice, help them um, find their potential or reach whatever goals they, they wanted to reach after they finished their degrees. Um, but this role allows me to really look at the institution as a whole and think about how do we shift the culture? How do we deal with the, the epistemological issues I talked about at the beginning? How do we help minoritized students feel heard, feel they can have a voice and really see a path for themselves in the professoriate and change the kinds of ways we train and, and what values we instill um, through graduate study. And so that's where I am now. And uh, it's been a, a heck of a ride the last three years in terms of the kinds of things um, I dealt with. I, I joke, I can now put crisis management on my CV, but it's been a lot of fun. And it's just uh, every day, I just feel so humbled and privileged by our students and how amazing they are and the incredible work that they're doing. And so, being able to help them a little bit um, in their journeys is, is a great gift that I appreciate very much. I, I have to, to tell you that, um, you know, uh, coming from the grad student space that uh, a lot of us were very expected, uh, very excited when you came on board and um, my interactions with you, I've, I've deeply appreciated the authenticity you bring to the space. If I say, how are you doing? You're actually honest, uh, which I, I deeply appreciate. And I, I was a fan of your predecessor, uh, Fiona Doyle. Um, but I have to say that especially within uh, minoritized populations on our campus, we were deeply excited about your presence. And uh, yeah, and thank you for sharing the space with me. Uh, so I have to tell you, looking looking back to your your predecessor and everybody else here has heard the story already. I won uh, one of the fellowships and I attended one of the welcome fellowship sessions. And uh, somebody went to the front of the room. He's not a dean anymore. I have no idea who he was. And he's just like, "Yeah, I remember when I was y'all fresh out of undergrad." And I'm like, mm, "Not all of us are fresh out of undergrads." I was excited about your presence uh, because I thought you would think more broadly about who we might be, that we weren't that 1950s white guy with no kids straight from undergrad. So can you talk a little bit about um, how you brought your experience of other um, to your, your vision for the grad division and, and um, yeah. Well, that's still a work in progress, I would say. Um, it has struck me how much, even not only at the doctoral level, but the master's level, we still imagine that a graduate student is somebody straight out of undergrad, um, who's not responsible for anyone other than themselves, that doesn't have, um, any sort of obligations, uh, not only to their immediate family, but to broader family members. And so that is reflected in, you know, we have a GPA requirement um, 
for, for graduate study. And at least, especially for our mid-career master's programs, we're talking about people's GPAs from literally 25 years ago. And right, is that the thing that we should be caring about? We also thinking about student parents, I'm, I'm a parent myself and, and the different demands that that requires, thinking about other kinds of familial obligations. And so I've tried in each piece of our work, working closely with the Basic Needs Center to be able to provide support. As an example, I had a student um, who comes from, you know, a low, uh, you know, they, uh, an economically precarious background and, and his father passed away and he had to pay for his father's funeral, right? And so this is not something that you can choose. And we don't really have a box for that, right? In, in, in how we think about financial aid or how we think about uh, student support or, you know, people who have to go home in order to support family for a period of time. We don't really allow part-time study. We didn't allow by and large remote study at the graduate level. And so I'm hoping COVID actually helps us think more deeply about these issues. It's true for undergraduates as well as graduate students. Um, if, if folks want to read some really good research on this, the Pathways to the Periphery study that Danny Solorzano from UCLA and Amanda Datnow from UC San Diego put together, they followed a number of different kinds of students, but what they found, they were studying students who were in poverty um, when they started post-secondary and that people drop out. There's no straight linear line, right? It's, it's not students who, as you said, Nanette, right, who can go home, do their laundry, you know, not responsible for financial support for their parents, uh, that that's just not who we're talking about. And if we want UC um, and, and Berkeley more specifically to act, to be accessible to a broad set of students, we need to broaden um, our, our image, right, of, of what folks, the kinds of places people come from and therefore what kinds of supports we have. And so I think that's a work in progress, but I think it's really important if we're serious about uh, changing the face, quote unquote, of, of our student population and of the professoriate to really realize people, people then are going to come with different kinds of needs that aren't really how our systems were set up in the first place. And can you talk a little bit about uh, um, generally about Berkeley's initiatives for other students that uh, are were not thought of uh, when when uh, you know uh, when higher education was founded on this continent? So undocumented students, uh, yeah. our, we have our underground scholars program at Berkeley, uh, which has a a, a, a good sized population of students who are formerly incarcerated. Um, our international student population. Uh, and, and with the international student population, I'm, I'm curious as to how uh, Berkeley and other schools are responding to the loss of opportunities um, for our students. So we have at least one student, under, former undergrad in the room, um, who had an internship uh, offer, and which was pulled uh, this summer, an international student. And I'm hearing this happening across international populations from Berkeley, jobs and internships from our students. Um, so I, I'd love to know sort of uh, uh, how you pull those students in and if there are any initiatives or things um, that are happening to support them that you might want to share. Thank you. That's, that's a big question with a lot of different pieces. So the first, um, thinking about undocumented students, this is a personal um, passion of mine. And so a lot of the work around undocumented students, I'm, I'm happy to say Berkeley, I think, was an early leader in this space. Um, and then the University of California has been an early leader in this space, but much of that work had been focused on the undergraduate population. And what folks, I think, didn't fully think through at that time was that the success at the undergraduate level means we're going to have more and more undocumented students at the graduate level. And that not all undocumented students are the same, right? It depends on your, you know, if you have DACA versus TPS versus some other sort of status. There are lots of different ways to be unauthorized in the United States, and those all have implications for your ability to work, your ability to receive certain kinds of resources. And so I've um, been working closely. We have a dedicated under, uh, undocumented student coordinator at the graduate level here within the graduate division, which I'm very proud of. Uh, which was a partnership with the Division of Equity and Inclusion. We got uh, student service, student fee funding for that in an ongoing way. And we've really been working um, thoughtfully to think about how to package those students, how to make sure that they have the same kinds of financial resources uh, that other students have. Um, the, the challenge is that many of these things are outside of our control. And so obviously we have to set, stay within the legal parameters of what's allowed both under California state law and under federal law, but to do everything we can to be as flexible as possible within those guardrails, right? Of what the legal structure is. Our approach to international students is similar. There, there are many things about their experiences that we cannot control and uh, USCIS is not intuitive and is not an easy system to manage and we don't make it simple for international students. So we can't fix that, but what we can do in the Berkeley International Office deserves a tremendous amount of credit. That's not under me. 
uh, they work very carefully and provide a lot of one-on-one -on -one support with students because it's very uh, it's very individualized, right? What, what your visa status, what kinds of documentation you need, what's an option. But it's been um, the last few years, it's just been a really challenging time for international students. So if there are any on this call, I just want to say that uh, I know I speak for my colleagues across the country that we want to do everything possible. We know that higher education benefits tremendously from the presence of international students. We, we need to be global universities because knowledge should be global. And so within the context of what we can do, we just try to provide that, that um, careful support and, and just uh, make sure that message is clear, right, that we really value um, the fact that students come from around the world to, to join our intellectual community and, and it's all the richer because of it. Um, in terms of system impacted students, I think that's another place where a lot of the work had happened at the undergraduate level and we're just shifting to think about, well, what does it mean to support students who've experienced certain kinds of trauma, who've had certain kinds of experiences, who may need different kinds of financial support or other kinds of supports um, as they move through graduate study. And so I, I would say that that's also a work in progress. Um, and we're thinking carefully about how best to, again, tailor the kinds of resources we have to make sure that we're encompassing the full range of experiences that students bring. And then the last community that you didn't talk about, which is, I think, really important that we're just starting to, to work more closely on, thanks to the advocacy of, of, um, of some of our graduate students, is, is um, former foster youth. Um, they, these are youth that, uh, you know, individuals who, have to check that box when they apply to Berkeley, at least for, for graduate school, but for, we never did any, anything with that information. So we just instituted um, a, a partnership with the Hope Scholars Program to provide financial support, additional financial support for those students, because obviously they have literally no safety net, right? They have no one to go to. Um, they may have you know, other kinds of, of challenges and issues that they've overcome in their lives. And so again, making sure that we know who those students are. And again, we'll be able to proactively offer support I think um, at a place like Berkeley, because we're so big, we have a lot of resources, but the expectation had always been sort of a passive one that we, you know, folks come to us, students come to us when they need uh, support, but it's difficult for students sometimes to even know that that support is there. And at least I found often it's the students who need the most support who are not able to reach out, right? Because they're, they're having challenges or experiencing difficulties. And so we're trying to then be much more proactive and much more offering resources rather than sort of sitting back and, and waiting for people to come to us. So all those things are a work in progress, but I think at a, at, at a minimum level, the fact that we're sort of thinking about and, and considering and talking to, right, the students who, who have these different experiences to make sure that our policies and our practices really do encompass the full range of, of graduate student need that's, that exists on campus. Thank you so much for, I, I know that was a, a fairly complex question and uh, I, I think you dealt with it with a plum, so thank you. Uh, and I know um, I, I can't speak for the student who's here who's a Berkeley alum, but I will make sure that he circles back around. Uh, he was uh, part of the UDC program and moved to DC. Uh, so we found this opportunity and, and have been pouring into him uh, here. And I've already talked to some other folks on this call who are in DC and we're gonna continue to pour into him over the summer to make sure before he heads back home, he has an incredible opportunity. All right, so I'm seeing lots of hands up. Uh, so before I uh, jump into the first question, I would just like to give you a chance to, to brag about our Pulse surveys. Is anybody else doing this? Where'd you get the idea? Uh, and then uh, we'll go down the list uh, that I uh, dropped in the chat box. I, I can't claim for it to have been my idea per se. We did talk about um, the fact that we, need, we needed more information in real time to just know how students were doing. Um, I don't know if other people are doing this. One of the challenges in higher ed is we don't actually, it's such a complex sector we don't always know what other folks are doing and we don't always benefit from what other folks are doing. So I can't answer that part of the question, but it was really more just um, a, a realization on the part of folks that were having conversations about how to ensure student support in this unprecedented time and realizing we needed sort of real time, how are folks doing, you know, just again, taking the pulse, right, of, of, of the students in order to try to pivot as quickly as we can to address these last two crazy years um, on campus. All right, we're gonna start off with Daniel. And I would like to ask everyone uh, as you come on to mention your institution and whether your institution does anything like this. So we can take an informal poll. So Daniel is easy, he's a UC Berkeley student. Go ahead, Daniel, take it away. Um, yeah, I, I, I really appreciate the sort of philosophy that you bring to your work here both in, in terms of like the focus on the tales 
and also thinking carefully about like interpretations of data. Um, I have a question about sort of data collection. Um, I agree that the pulse surveys are innovative, but I'll be honest that as a student, I've never taken one. And that's because it's hard to find time to do them. Yep. Um, and in my experience, as somebody who's done research of undergraduates, is that they're a very hard population to survey, especially at UC Berkeley, where everyone is involved in a lot and super high achieving. And from what I understand, most of these surveys go out like over email, people miss emails. So I'm curious about what do your response rates look like and are you satisfied with them? Yeah. And then do you think about, um, you know, especially because in your video, you talk about how like, there are many forms of data that we can collect, right? So I'm wondering if you think about like, moving beyond pulse survey sent out over email to try to collect like a, a wider variety of, of data regarding students' experiences um, at the university. Absolutely, and this is going to be, I'm gonna say work in progress a lot. This is another work in progress. Um, so the response rates have actually been pretty good at Berkeley. Um, historically, they've been over 50%, which is pretty good for an email. I mean, that's kind of amazing for an email survey. And so that's one of the reasons that folks haven't really dug in very much about response rate. I would assume and guess, um, again, this hasn't, one of the, I, I, I take it, one of the things, at least at Berkeley, I think we have not invested enough in is institutional research. And so the challenge is because we have very few staff on whose shoulders this work rests and who do amazing work, this is not a criticism of them by any stretch, is that they don't always have time to do that second level analysis, right? So what I would really love, right, is that after we do the initial analysis, we would go in and say, okay, who did answer and who didn't, right? Are there, are there trends in terms of even with a 50% response rate, I'm guessing there's certain sectors of the community that we're probably not hearing from, um, but we haven't had the, the resources to dig in at that level. That's what I would like to do as the next step. The response rates have been going down. So I've, again, I think to your point, and, and as someone who do in, in my, with another hat, I do email surveys um, for clients and, and it has been really hard, especially in the last year to get response rates in, in the range that is normal or typical. And so I think we really have to be mindful of, of how to do that. Um, one of the ideas with the Pulse survey was that it's short enough that that was a way to encourage response. I think that's an important thing is thinking about the late length of the instrument. The graduate experience survey that the Office of the President fielded for the first time last spring is a massive one, I think 120 question, it's a massive instrument. I'm a little skeptical about people's ability. I, I wonder who fills those out, to be completely frank. And so I think that has certain value. And I think that's why what I was trying to say in the video is, is it's really important to triangulate different kinds of information, right? So there's a set of information you can get from 120, you know, question survey. There's a set of information you can get from a five question pulse survey. You probably need to have some kinds of qualitative, qualitative information or dig in and say, okay, who didn't answer? Maybe try to do qualitative analysis with them or find other kinds of institutional information that you may have about, you know, course completion, incompletes, grades, you know, all those kinds of things that we have to paint a picture, a more full picture. And so what I would like to do in the long term is really institutionalize that triangulation of data. Another option, another new way to do surveys is to have people um, sign up for a panel and that you would just get a text once, once a month or maybe twice a semester that just says, how are you doing today? And you just answer via text, right? Because again, we also know if we're thinking about well-being and climate, people ebb and flow over the course of the semester, right? And so I think it's really important to think about time in a different way, to think about uh, different kinds of students, and then also to then uh, be very intentional about collecting data in a way that can help you get a better sense of the whole population and again, how they move through uh, their academic life. So that's what I'm hoping to build out and we're just in the first stages of, of doing that. So okay. I have a question that, uh, oops, I have a question that piggybacks on Daniel. Uh, so you uh, you know that I study privacy, cybersecurity, and surveillance. 
uh, Lisa. So I'm wondering what you do uh, to protect the privacy, respect the privacy of our students. Um, how do you ensure specifically that students, particularly students of color who make up a smaller population, a portion of our population are therefore easier to identify or appropriately protected? So I feel very strongly about this as probably the only black 44 year old PhD student of color at Berkeley. I feel like every time I fill out one of these and I do it every time because I know they're yours, um, that they're like, yep, that's Nanette, you know, so how do you, how do you, how do you protect me, Lisa? I am, I am especially sensitive to this because I did an in-depth interview for for a qualitative research project when I was a graduate student where they anonymized me by saying I was a Latina political science doctoral student. And at the time, obviously I was the only one at Yale. So that wasn't really anonymous. I totally, totally feel you, Nanette. Um, we're thinking, we're creating these uh, dashboards. So right now we're creating dashboards for each department that um, includes all the financial information for graduate students, demographic information, um, and then adding in the attitudinal survey information. And we are exactly in these conversations. How do we think about cell size and reporting of that information so that we don't out students? And I'm going to say it is more art than science, um, but it's really important that is top of mind for us to make sure that we're not reporting information in such a way that you can know, oh, this student said X. Um, and that's very difficult, especially, you know, A, for students of color, but then also be just in small departments, right? It, in an department that's got a graduate population of 20, it's very hard to have anonymity. And so we're trying to balance then how do you give departments the information they need to know how their students are doing, right? Because the other thing is, again, thinking about the tails, we had a climate survey on campus a couple of years ago, and, and you know, it's like 85% of students say that they're they're fine. Like, well, is that success? Like, what does success look like in climate, right? Is it 90? Is it 95? Is it 100? Like, how do you think about? So you actually do need to know who are who are those 15% that are not having a good experience. And so we're thinking, and if you have suggestions, that we're, we're thinking hard about how do we make sure that faculty know when students raise concerns, but make sure that the concerns are presented in a way that it's not clear who, they can't identify who exactly is the person who raised them. I think this is something, um, you know, if, if other people are in other institutions where you guys have figured this out, we would really appreciate some help uh, because especially at the graduate level, it's hard. It's easier at the undergraduate level, at least at a place like Berkeley, because there's so many students, but the graduate level, it is very difficult. But I think really important because we can't fix, even if you only have one student who's really unhappy, you know, you need to know that that's true and you need to figure out what it is that that went wrong um, with that student. So so one thought, and this is something that uh, we've we've uh, gone back and forth within this space because we're an interdisciplinary space, is that uh, understanding of I IRB is not universal within the academic space. Uh, there are um, folks for whom the idea of moving fast and breaking things um, is is tantamount to to protecting. So uh, one suggestion could be a required IRB training for any faculty um, that are seeing these sorts of data and collecting these sorts of data. Because uh, I, I think these little surveys go out in departments uh, and, and I, I'm more comfortable filling out one of these things at the graduate level or the whole system level than my own department. Uh, because if somebody has it and they, you know, I, I've seen I've seen my direct quote on a slide and cringed before, uh, not not in my department, but elsewhere on our campus where I'm just like, wow, OK, uh, that's me. Uh, <laughs> so uh, I think that's important. I'm also going to drop something in the chat box, and I don't know if other schools have this, but we have these uh, graduate student assessment fellows. Um, so they're quantitatively trained students who jump in uh, and do consulting projects within the university and could do something exactly like this if, if you didn't create one on your own. I, this just seems like right for you to hire Daniel uh, to uh, to help with this. You know, I'm forever trying to get my classmate a job. Uh, so, uh, all right, so let's jump in. More questions. Rebecca, what do you got? Prof excuse <clears throat> Assistant Professor Shu. Hi, uh, so I have a question for, uh, several questions for Dr. Bedot. Yeah, uh, so I'm wondering, like, what is the biggest issue right now that you found from the survey at UC Berkeley right now? And then how do you address students' issue? Like, do you have some sort of budget that you can use immediately to respond to the difficulties uh, faced by students? That's my that question. Is, those are both really good questions. Um, so I, I'll say that what I feel like is the most important issue is based both on the survey responses and also just conversations I've had with students. And so I, th I feel like there are two things. I think that there's, and they're related. So I think um, we, Experiences of anxiety and depression were already high before COVID. They went up during COVID and they've been going down. But what 
I'm sensing and what it looks like is that is that the, how they manifest is changing. And so a lot of the ways in which we identified students in distress in the past aren't working, that people's expression of anxiety and depression just looks different now. And, and, and so we've been talking a lot about how, um, how to fix that. And so one of the reasons we created this peer support provider program is I thought, well, peer to peer, like maybe a graduate student who's feeling just kind of down is going to be more will willing to reach out to another peer or a fellow graduate student. Um, and, and we made sure to put people's kind of pictures and profiles on the website. So, you know, okay, this is a person that I feel like I can talk to. And so trying to find avenues to be able to identify students in distress that, that I think is going to be a huge issue for the next few years. And then related to that, at least what I'm hearing from graduate students, and this did not come from the survey, is just a general sort of malaise about, you know, why are we here? What are we doing? Is this what I should be doing? And, and I think that's, you know, graduate student school is hard, even in the best of circumstances, at least in my experience, when I did it in my 20s, and you know, my friends had real jobs, and they had money, and they were going to clubs, and they're traveling, and I'm sitting here reading Schumpeter, right? Like, it just does not feel joyous. And so, I think under the best of circumstances, it's difficult because you're in this kind of liminal space. You're not a student, you're sort of a student. My family telling me, when are you gonna get done with school? You know, just all of that. When are you gonna get a real job? You know, all those questions. So I think that the pandemic has just deepened that general sort of existential difficulty that I think is part of doctoral study. And so um, we're trying to think about, you know, helping departments identify those students, helping them find kind of jumpstart, find some joy, find some, purpose again in their research so that they can move through and and at least on our campus it doesn't look like this is what I'm talking about triangulation so my analysis is the folks who were close to being done finished like in general the number of degrees that we're conferring is about the same as it was pre-pandemic the folks I'm worried about are really those folks in the middle and I have to say that institutionally we don't have a lot of really good uh, mechanisms to support those students. And so that's the part that I'm thinking a lot about is how to help those folks, remind them why they went to graduate school, how, why they're, you know, submitting themselves to this torture, you know, and, and, and why it is that they, that they imagine themselves in either an academic career or, or whatever else they thought they would do with a doctoral degree. But um, that's what we're working on. And I think that we're going to be having to work on that for, for a number of years to just help those students find their path and make sure that they're where they wanna be um, a few years from now. So uh, we have a queue going. I'm super excited uh, to get some other questions in, but I wanna ask you another one. And I just have to pause for the best joke in the world about Schumpeter, just thank you. That's going out on Twitter. Um, okay, so, um, I think uh, so. I think you're uniquely um, situated to think about this question for us, um, given the fact that you study community um, community movements and engagement, uh, and the fact that uh, you know you're a graduate student of color and now um, in a in a position where you can see things more broadly. Do you have any advice or suggestions? And this is outside of Berkeley. This is just writ large for how we keep our departments accountable to meeting the needs of graduate students, specifically graduate students of color. Um, I ask this because I'm, I'm sure I'm not the only one here who is who is tired. Um, so, you know, alongside uh, trying to try to do this, this damn thing as a PhD student, many of us are also doing DEI work that we shouldn't have to do um, and are and are asking for things or, or doing things, running initiatives that we needed when we got here. So what do we do to keep our institutions accountable um, while also balancing um, keeping ourselves uh, sane? That is an excellent question. Um, I'll start by saying, I mean, part of the reason I wanted to be in this role is that students shouldn't be doing that. I should be doing that, right? Like, like your, your, your institution should be doing that. Your chair should be doing that. It shouldn't be on students. I know often it is on students and I know that there's a careful balance. The, the, the activism that I engaged with as a graduate student actually really helped me stay in graduate school, right? It connected me to other students who had similar interests. It made me feel empowered. So I, what we tried to do, part of the reason we created something called the Diversity and Community Fellows Program, which is a program that pays students for that work, right? So pays them to run programming, right? And to put programs together. Um, 
And, 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 but, but I think it has to happen at the, at the system level, right? It has to happen at the institutional level. And the challenge with graduate study, so at Berkeley, we have 125 different graduate programs, right? And every single graduate program is trying to reinvent the wheel. And so I think it's important to think about, well, what are the pieces that need to sit in the center? And what are the things that you have to give to the center? And what are the pieces that need to sit in the departments? And so I would say just being really mindful of Absolutely, I'm not telling people not to engage in activism. Again, I think it's a really important part of life and, and, and it's important, um, uh, it's something that feeds you in important ways. And so I, I think it shouldn't just be seen as, as, as sort of a cost and work. I think that there's value in, in doing it, but also being very careful about saying, okay, here's my line, right? Or here's my boundary. Here's, here's what I'm willing to give to this. And, and here's what I'm not. And here's the place where I think it needs to be handed off to the central administration or it needs to be handed off to the dean of my division or it needs to be handed off to somebody at a higher authority because it's beyond even the, the, the scope of the department. So I just think being thoughtful about how you're spending your time because in the end, you know, students are here to get a degree, right? Um, when I was an undergraduate, people talked about majoring in Mecha, right? And like, it's not a dig on Mecha, right? But on, if, if you don't get your degree, Right, and you can't go into your field and you can't get the thing that you meant to come to the university for, then, then that's not the point, right? And so I, I, think, I think it's important for everyone to figure out what their balance is and figure out what their boundaries are um, in order to make sure that you, you know, do the work that feeds you and, and that you're able to feel like you have a voice in the academy, but also stay focused on the fact that you being in the academy in the long term, it's a marathon, not a sprint, right? And so that's really important as well. And how do you balance both those things in terms of how you, you know, divvy up your life and obviously make time for rest and exercise and you know, doing things with the people you love and, and having a life? Because I think that's another part of what we don't talk enough about that this, this job, it is just a job, it is not a religious calling, needs to be able to accommodate your life. And so part of your life may be activism or not. The other thing is I think often students of color feel this obligation to do political work and, and to say, you know, sometimes you should, you don't have to wanna to do it if you don't wanna do it. And sometimes you may wanna leave it to somebody else. I, I realized this the first time I went on sabbatical that it was in fact hubris for me to think that I was the only person able to do X, Y, or Z. Actually, there are lots of other people who will step up if you take a step back. And so also just remembering that you're not the only one necessarily and that um, you know taking care of yourself is the number one priority. You have to put the mask on yourself before you can put it on somebody else. Thank you so much. Uh, I, I think uh, many of us feel that responsibility you describe um, I think some of the best I, advice I received when I uh, did my master's at the Harvard Kennedy School is that you're going to realize this place is imperfect. There are going to be scratches on the wall and paint. And there's not going to, and things are, you're going to expect an ideal and you can fend, spend your entire time trying to paint the walls. In the end, the goal is to get out of here and, and paint the world. Um, so, and that someone also told me, be mindful of the threshold of resentment. When you hit that point where you start to resent things, it's time to step away and keeping on top of your own tiredness and making sure you have a community of support uh, is, a, is a beautiful thing. So our next question is from Grace. Go ahead and turn your camera on and join us. Um, I just wanna confirm that Erica wasn't next because I, I think she was next on the, on the list and I just don't wanna take her space away. I don't, oh yes, yes, thank you. I appreciate that. Erica, let's swap out. I miss somebody there. Sorry about that. I love this community. Erica Grace Renee Remesa. I was going to message you. Nana, you, you skipped me. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> so first I, I uh, want to say that I watch your video and I really appreciate your position. And my questions are related with the video. So, uh, so you described some of the benefits of using the post survey when compared with the yearly survey to, to understand the studies well being and other aspects. So you, I was just wondering uh, if there you lose things by using the post survey instead of the yearly survey. And then the other question that I have, could you describe some of the challenges, challenges of implementing what you learn from the results of the, the student survey? And then lastly, in the video, you mentioned an author who seems to be do a great job looking to the detail of the results. And I could not get the name on the video. Do you mind spelling the name? Thank you. 
spelling the name of uh, starting with the last question i'm not sure i understood the last question oh so uh, so during the during the your your video you talk about alter that works like analyze the tail of the 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 results of when you work in survey looking not just to the the center of the survey just looking at this and then you mentioned the name and i was like i i could not yeah oh okay um it's zuberi i believe that's the person i um i mentioned he's a sociologist i'm trying to of course as, as i'm trying to get his website my my so people can, I'll find it and I'll put it in the chat, but I'll, I'll, I'll put the name in the chat. Um, I'm going to take your question sort of out of order. Um, I actually think the biggest weakness higher ed institutions have is in fact making survey information actionable, right? Or I guess maybe I should speak from the eye from an institutional standpoint. Berkeley has a ton of data about its students. The University of California has a ton of data about its students and we don't actually apply it very effectively. And so I think that is a muscle that we all need to build. And, and um, I'm not going to claim that I know exactly how to do that. Uh, but what we did with the pulse surveys, at least the fact that they were so short actually made them more actionable, right? That you could see, okay, and students are saying that they want their classrooms, you know, they don't want to go back, or if they do want to go back, they don't want to go back with as many people. We can, we can take that into consideration. We have these cross-functional working groups that we put together during COVID. So one of which was instructional planning to, to multiple times plan for coming back to the classroom and, and thinking about all the different uh, permutations of that, right, d depending on the kinds of classes. And so it was really helpful to have that baseline information as we were making decisions about exception requests and other requests of how exactly we were going to structure the return to campus when we we're coming back. So that was a very easy one. And I think part of what made it easy is because it was five answers, right? Whereas if you've got a 120 question survey, and as you're thinking about your research, um, something that people often, I know you may not be doing survey research, but if you're doing anything related to survey research, what is your dependent variable? <laughs> what question are you going to actually answer, right? And often we have these massive instruments that don't, that aren't in fact able to be analyzed in a meaningful way in terms of their applicability in, in real time or in real life or anything like that. And so that is something that I think we need to work on when we're creating the instruments. And so when I work with clients um, in, in my other hat capacity, I, I ask people to focus it like, what do you want to learn? Right. I don't think we say, like, what exactly do we want to learn? What do we want to get out of this? Instead, we're like, oh, would it really, really be nice to know the answer to this question? Or couldn't be. We're all curious. That's why we became academics, right? We're curious about a lot of different kinds of things. And so we end up kind of taking the kitchen sink approach to data collection. And I think that's part of what in, on the back end makes it difficult to actually then have actionable and usable information. Um, coming out. And so I think being much more clear about what you're trying to learn up front, making sure your instrument aligns with what you want to learn, and then having a very clear sense of like, okay, this office is going to have to know the answer to this question. This office is going to have to answer the, you know, to this question. Maybe a working group comes out of the survey analysis where you, you know, brainstorm and troubleshoot how you're going to partner to in fact do something about what it is you find or dig in deeper with focus groups or qualitative information to really get up what are the issues that are at the heart of, of what students are saying? Um, because the way I think about it is surveys tell us the what, they cannot tell us the why. And so you can't fix policy if you don't know the why. And so that's why I think this triangulation approach is the most important one, because you need to figure out what different kinds of information you need in order to actually then know, okay, so this office needs to have more staff. They need to focus on this kind of student. They need to not do this thing that they were doing, et cetera, et cetera. And so I feel like that's the institutional level change that needs to happen. And for it to be data-driven, it has to have sometimes different kinds of data. I hope that answers your question, Erica. Did Let's, that, uh, did that, did we get your answer there, Erica? Yes. She said, thank you. All right. Uh, so uh, let's, uh, let's have Grace come back on screen. Go ahead, Grace. All right. I'm going to start off by saying I'm at the City University of New York and we do not do poll surveys. Um, so thank you for starting that initiative elsewhere. Um, okay. So I, really appreciate you talking about the tales of distributions and how we should care about them a little bit more. Um, I've worked in centers for institutional evaluation and we have not really talked about the tales, so I appreciate you bringing that up. 
I'm curious as to how you make funding agencies and policy institutes care about the tales, because um, usually they care about bigger picture. I haven't figured that one out yet, Grace. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm just gonna admit that. Um, I mean, the way I've done it or dealt with it in my own work is um, to just talk very explicitly about why generalizability is not always of the right thing. And, and I think in some ways, generalizability is, is normative whiteness, right? Because if you're generalizing by definition, you're norming to the, minor, to the majority. And if you're norming to the majority, at least in US society, in most places, other than Hawaii, um, you're actually norming to the white majority. And so thinking, asking institutions and funders to really think about the assumptions embedded in the values that they have in terms of the impact of their work, um, I have found to be helpful. And I have found um, folks that then support that and support the kind of work. Um, but, but it really is swimming against the tide in social sciences. And so that's why I think more people who have that more nuanced approach, I do think there's been progress over the last you know, decade, at least in my own field, that people actually talk about heterogeneous treatment effects, right? The idea that you're not just assuming if, if it's one direction, that that's all that matters. Um, but I think there's a lot more work to be done. And I think if there's a lot of fruitful kind of conceptualization and theorizing to be done about how do we actually analyze the assumptions of the things that we, that the tools that we use, and then also how do we think about it? That's why I like Zuberi's work so much because he really asks us to focus on interpretation. Um, but then also what are the values at the core of what we think is a real finding, right? What counts as a, as a finding? And so I think those conversations are happening in different pockets, but you guys are the future of the field. And so the more that people can um, push those conversations and really do work that asks those questions, I think the better we will be able to describe the social world. I'm gonna invite Renee and Ramesa to join me on camera and uh, they'll ask our final two questions, unless I can squeeze in one more at the end, which I will try. Okay. Hi, Dr. Bedoya. Um, I'm Renee. I attend UC Berkeley as well. Um, and I'm one of the coordinators for GAIC. So I work with um, Denzel in the diversity office. Um, so my question is more towards the video. Um, you talked about um, web scraping in relation to um, how that could help current graduate students. I thought that was a really uh, good idea. So I was wondering, what um, what do you think that would look like um, using like web scraping? I think you mentioned LinkedIn um, to be able to like help current graduate students um, to kind of see where the future, where our future is going from, you know, the previous students. So I think, I, I'm not sure if I entirely remember, I think I was talking about uh, thinking, of, so for example, for departments to use that to really be able to list the trajectory of, the, of their students um, is one approach. I think, again, web scraping, um, if you want population level information about, okay, everybody who, you know, has a degree from this place and is doing this thing. I mean, one can imagine different kinds of research projects where you use that tool to, in fact, get, you know, a large amount of information on a particular topic. Um, but again, always being mindful, right, of like who's not, who's, who's going to probably be missing from that information? What are the potential pitfalls? Um, what are the potential biases that are inherent in those kinds of tools? Because they're blunt instruments, right? And so I think it's, it's not that certain tools are bad. I think there was a, when, when there was the quantitative, qualitative debates, there was almost this idea that if you're doing qualitative work, by definition, you were doing good. Um, but I don't think the method can save you. Like what saves you is your is your ontology and epistemology, right? That underlies what it is that you're doing. And so it was really more, it's a tool that allows you to gather, there are all these tools now that allow you to gather a bunch of information from, I mean, back to our original point, right? Without expecting somebody to answer a survey or, or asking somebody to self-select into a study. And there's a lot that you can gain from that information if you're really mindful of, of what it can and what it can't tell you. Does that answer your question, Renee? Does that help? Yeah, I was just wondering what, I guess, like, what do you think it would look like in terms of, like, specifically to Berkeley, um, you know, looking at what students are doing um, versus, like, how, not versus, but, and how it can help current graduate students. But yes, it, it does answer part of the question. Yeah, so, the, well, the other part, so, and I should say, Harvard just did this. They did, they did both, it was, a, they did a combination of an alumni survey, and then they used LinkedIn to just follow their, their alums, right? And what they found was that half 
only about, about half of their students in humanities and social sciences were in academic jobs, right? And so if that's the number at Harvard, I'm guessing it may be about the same at Berkeley, but um, it's probably gonna be a lot lower in a lot of different places. And I think if students, we need to set students' expectations appropriately, right? And, and, and not tell them that this is, success is this one thing. If you know only half your students are actually getting that one thing, you can't define success that way. And so I think destigmatizing other paths is really important. I think there are lots of wonderful things that you can do with doctoral study. I think doctoral study, despite my um, negative comments earlier, you get a, a number, like there are great skills that you can apply in a lot of different domains that you get from having done doctoral study, right? Analytical skills and other kinds of skills, just the ability to gather a bunch of information in a short period of time and to synthesize it, that actually is really valuable in a lot of different parts of life. But you need, students need to know what they're getting into, right? And I think right now we're sort of selling, um, a path that's not really a path. And, and, and so we need to know more as an institution about what paths our student take so that we can also then um, have training and other kinds of programming available to them so that we're providing them with the tools that they need to be able to launch, right, in whatever area they want. So you know the full gamut of possibility of things that people with your kind of degree have done. And then, you know, if you're a competent, if you're a computational social scientist, well, maybe there's a certificate that you need for that. Or if you want to do universal design and pedagogy, there's a certificate you can do for that. Or like that we provide you with workshops and other kinds of things. So you can test out internships, externships, right? These are all kinds of things. If we know that this one professorial path is not actually what our students are doing or the majority of our students are doing, then it's on us to make sure that you have other kinds of opportunities and you get to find out what other things you could do that in fact still bring you joy and fulfillment um, in your professional career. I hope that answers the other part of the question. Yes, so thank you so much. Truth in advertising, that's what we need to do. <laughs> Before I hand uh, the mic to Ramesa for the last question, I, I just want to echo Renee's point and, and just say that I'm, I'm excited about the fact that when I eventually become a faculty member, that I will be able to pull on a knowledge of having worked outside of academia first, but I think, I think we have an expectation that our faculty will understand that when many of them went straight through. So beefing up career services and finding other ways beyond academia uh, to, to give students those options, I think, is, is, is tantamount. Um, I, I also want to just point out, Renee mentioned Denzel. So Lisa's, Lisa's chief of staff is not Denzel Washington. It is Denzel Street. So just making sure that's out there, Dr. Denzel Street. All right, uh, Rumesa, go ahead. Uh, last question, final word. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I'm just wondering, uh, I don't know whether you have some sort of open-ended questions in your survey, but I'm just wondering how you deal with the cases of mobbing and discrimination if the students give such cases, because I experienced such a thing in my BA, and then I, I experienced a mobbing from French language courses, and then because of my headscarf, I just, there was an open-ended question, and then I just wrote down there, but, and then I also withdrew, withdrew the course because of that. But then I learned that every year with this, this lecture, he always got this, gets this kind of you know response from the students, but no one does anything. So I'm just wondering if, when you see such cases of discrimination and mobbing, uh, how how do you how do you deal with that? That's a really good question. So um, at least at our institution, if on a survey that we give, we get a report of discrimination, um, I would lift that up to our office um, of our OPHD office, um, which of course I can't right now remember what the acronym stands for, um, Office of Prevention of Harassment and Discrimination, I think is what it is. Um, and I have to say, this is another muscle that I think a lot of institutions are trying to um, develop because there was a pretty robust structure around Title IX reporting at most institutions whether it was perfect or not, we can have it, that's, that's a separate um, conversation, but it was very clear, right? If you have a Title IX discrimination complaint, it goes straight to um, a particular office. Most institutions were less clear about what to do with either racial or religious discrimination or other kinds of discrimination and harassment. And so what we are doing at Berkeley, at least, is we're we have consolidated that into one office. So there's one place because often also there are intersections, right? Often those, those kinds of experiences overlap. And we, at least until recently, didn't have a structure to, to, for students to appropriately um, uh, do that. And so what it would happen on our campus if we got a report like that in one of our surveys is we would immediately lift it up um, to that office whose job it is to investigate and to dig in and to find out um, what's actually going on. 
but I do think that that is something uh, you know many of our students still don't know that that's available to them. So then it's, it's we're in the process of socializing that to campus. And so I think it's really analogous to Title IX and having you need one place and one easy place to be able to say um, when students have those experiences so that we can actually address the problem. I do have to say that you actually raise an important point institutionally that I'm going to have to think about that teaching evaluations and reports that happen in course evaluations often just go to the faculty member. They don't, ne they don't necessarily get read by the chair or, or you know, it depends on in, in the department. And I'm realizing that may be a place where we should think about um, instituting some safeguards for exactly the kinds of experience that you're, I'm sorry, you have that experience, um, but the kinds of experience you're reporting. So I think that may be um, a, 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 a hole in the system is, is what, what happens to things that students write in teaching evaluations. So I'm gonna follow up with my folks and figure out how we deal with those because at least on our campus, as with everything, it's decentralized. And so it's, they're, they're not collected centrally, they're collected by the department. And, they're, um, and so that makes a systematic approach challenging. But thank and you I, for I, that. And I would add uh, for those outside of the US context um, uh, who, who are familiar with some of the thing, Title IX and such that, uh, um, that Lisa mentioned. So there, these things have different names. Uh, there are whistleblower offices. Um, there are, you know, LGBTQIA office. Uh, you know, a, a organization of Black students. There are lots of spaces where you can bring these things in and get support counseling. Um, there is, uh, there are lots of lots of places. So I, I, I encourage you when these things happen to to make sure you find support. So uh, thank you so much, all of you, for joining us. Thank you. Uh, uh, Lisa Garcia Vadoya, uh, for your um, your authenticity and your leadership. Thank you all for watching. For more information on Six Howard Mathematica, visit our website, follow us on social media, and join our email list.